The Ghost in the Mill by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Come, Sam, tell us a story, said I, as Sam and I crept to his knees. In the glow of the bright evening firelight, while Aunt Lois was busily rattling the tea things, and Grandmama, on the other end of the fireplace, was quietly setting the heel of the blue mixed yarn stocking. In those days, we had no magazines and daily papers, each reeling off a serial story. Once a week, the Columbian Sentinel came with from Boston with its slender stock of news and editorial, but all the multi-platform devices, pictorial, narrative, poetical, which kept the mind of the present generation ablaze with excitement, had not even had not then even in existence. There was no theater, no opera. There was no old town, or no parties or balls, except perhaps the annual election or Thanksgiving festival. And then winter came, and the sun went down at half past four o'clock and left the long, dark hours of evening to be provided for. The necessity of amusement became urgent. Hence, in those days, chimney corner storytelling became an art and accomplishment. Society then was full of traditions and narratives, which had all then certain glow of shifting mystery of the firelit hearth upon, the, upon them. They were told no sympathetic audiences by the rising and falling of soul members, with the hearth crickets filling up every pause. Then the aged told their stories to the young, tales of early life, tales of war and adventure, of forest days, of Indian captivities and escapes, of bears and wildcats and panthers, of rattlesnakes, of witches and wizards, and strange and wonderful dreams and appearances and providences. In those days of early Massachusetts, faith and credence were in the very air. Two-thirds of New England was then dark, unbroken forests, through whose tangled path the mysterious winter wind groaned and shrieked and howled weird noises and unaccountable clamors. Along the iron-bound shore, the stormful Atlantic raved and thundered and dashed its moaning waters as if to deaden and deafen any voice that might tell of the settled life of the old civilized world and shut us forever into the wilderness. A good storyteller in those days was always sure of a warm seat at the hearthstone and the delighted homage of children, and in all old town there was no better storyteller than Sam Lawson. Do, do tell us a story, said Harry, pressing upon him and opening very wide blue eyes, in which undoubting faith shone as in a mirror and let in to be something strange and different than common. Well, I know lots of strange things, said Sam, looking mysteriously into the fire. Why, I know things that if I should tell why people might say they wouldn't so, but they is so for all that. Oh, do tell us. Why should I scare you to death, maybe, said Sam doubtingly. Oh, pooh, no, you wouldn't. We b both burst out at once. But Sam was possessed by a reticent spirit and loved dearly to be wooed and impetured and go into go he only took up the great kitchen tongs and smote on the hickory four stick and when he flew apart in the middle a scattered shower of clear bright coals all over the earth mercy on us sam lawson said aunt lois in an indignant voice spinning round from her dishwashing don't you worry a grain miss lois said sam composedly i see the that are stick with them almost in two, and I thought I'd just settle it. I'd sweep up the coals now, he added, vigorously applying a turkey wing to the purpose as he knelt to the, on the earth, his spare, lean figure glowing in the blaze of the firelight and getting quite flushed with exertion. There now, he said, when he was br brushed over and under and between the fire irons and pursued the retreating ashes so far into the red, fiery citadel, that his finger ends are burning and tingling, that are as done now as well as Hepsi could herself could have done. It, I holler, sweep up the hearth. I think it's part of the man's business. Then he makes the fire. Hepsi's so used to seeing me and doing it that she don't see no kind of merit in it. It's just as long as Parson Lothar said in his sermon, folks hollers look in their common marcies. But come, Sam, that story, said Harry, I coaxily pressed upon him. 
and pulling him up and down into his seat in the corner. Lordy Massey, these are young uns," said Sam. They're never no contented on him, and tell him on story, and they just swallows it up as a dog does a gob of meat, and they're all ready for another. What do you want to hear now? And the fact was that Sam's stories had been told us so often that they were all arranged and ticketed in our minds. We knew every word of them. We could see him set him right if he varied a hair from the usual track. And still the interest in them was unabated. Still we shivered and clung to his knee in the mysterious parts and felt gentle. Cold chills rung down our spines at appropriate places. We were always in the most receptive and sympathetic condition. Tonight in particular was one of those thundering stormy ones. When the winds appeared to be holding a perfect mad carnival over my grandfather's house, they yelled and squealed round the corners. They collected in troops, came tumbling and roaring down chimney. They shook and tattled the buttery door at the sink room door and the cellar door and the chamber door, with the constant undertone of squeak and clatter, as if at every door were a cold, discontented spirit, tired of the old chill outside and longing for the warmth and comfort within. Well, boys, said Sam confidently, well, what do you have? Tell us, come down, come down. We should shout, both shouted with one voice. This was in our mind a number one among Sam's stories. You mustn't be frightened now, said Sam paternally. Oh, no, we aren't frightened ever, said we both in one breath. Not when we go to the cellar, all of cider, said Sam with severe scrutiny. If you could be down cellar and the candle should go down now. I ain't, said I. I ain't afraid of anything. I never knew what it was to be afraid of my life. Well then, said Sam, I tell you, this is one of the Captain Ebbins' song that I was a young boy about your business, I reckon. Captain Ebbs' song was the most respectable man. Your grandfather knew him very well. He was a deacon in the church in Dedham before he died. He was at Lexington when he first gun was fired against the British. He was a dreadful smart man, Captain Ebb was, and drove team a good many years between here and Boston. He married Lewis Peabody, and that was cousin to your grandmother then. Lewis was a real sensible woman, and I heard her tell a story as he told her. He was just, and it was just as he told to me, just exactly, and I shall never forget it if I live to be 900 years old, like Methuselah. You see, along back in those times, there used to be a fellow come round these parts, spring and fall, a peddle in goods, and his pack on his back, and his name was Jahil Lumido. Nobody rightly knew where he came from. He wasn't much a talker, but the woman rather liked him, and kind of liked to have him around. Women liked those some like some fellows, when men can't see no sort of reason why they should, and they liked this year at Lumadale. Though he was kind of mournful and thin and shad-bellied, and he had nothing to say to himself, but it got to be so, that the woman could count and calculate so many weeks before it was time Lumadale to be a real long, and they make up ginger snaps and preserves and pies, and make him stay to tea and at the houses and feed him on the best there was, and the story went round. He was a courtin' Phoebe Ann Parker, or Phoebe Ann was a courtin' him. Folks didn't rightly know which. Well, all of a sudden, Lomadow stopped coming round, and nobody knew why, only just he didn't come. It turned out that Phoebe Ann Parker had got a letter from him saying he'd be along afore Thanksgiving, but he didn't come, neither for nor th at Thanksgiving time, nor after, nor next spring. And finally the woman, the agent, be looking for him, and some said he was dead. Some said he'd gone to Canada, and some said he'd gone over to the old country. Well, as Phoebe Ann, she acted like a gal of sense, and married Bajah Moss, and thought no more about it. She took the right view on it, and said she was starting all things, and was ordered out for the best. And it was just as well folks couldn't always have their own way. And so in time, Lumidow was gone out of folks' minds, much as last year's apple blossom.
it's really affecting to think how these your folks is missed that so much sought by. There ain't nobody if there is ever so important, but that the world gets to go on on without him, pretty much as it did with him. Though there is some flurry at first, while well, the last thing that was in anybody's mind that ever should hear from Lomadao again, but there ain't nothing but what has its time a turning up, and it seems his turn was to come. Well, you see, it was the 19th of March, and Captain Eb Sawin started with the team for Boston. That day, there come on about the biggest storm that there had ever been in parts since the oldest man could remember. It was this year fine sift in snow that drives in your face like needles with the wind to cut your nose off. It made team in pretty tedious work. Captain Ebb was about the toughest man in them parts. He'd spent days in the woods a logging, and he'd been in the district of Maine a lumbering, and was about up to any sort of thing a man genially could be up to. But these are March winds sometimes does set a fellow so that neither nature nor grace can stand him. The captain used to say that he could stand any wind that blew it one way. Time for five minutes, but come to winds that blew all four points at the same time. Why they flustered him? Well, there was the sort of weather it was all day, and by sundown, Captain Ebb he got clean bewildered, so that he lost his road. And when night came on, he didn't know nothing where he was. You see, the country was all under drift, and the air so thick with snow that he couldn't see a foot afore him. The fact was, he got off the Boston Road without knowing it, and came out of a pair of bars nigh upon Sherborne, where old Cack Sparrow's mill is. Your grandfather used to know old Cack boys. He was dreadful drinking old critter that lived there all alone in the woods by himself, attending saw and grist mine, grist mill. He wasn't ours just that he was then. Time was that Cack was a pretty considerably likely young man and his wife was a respectable woman, Deacon Amos Pengal's daughter from Shoreborn. But you see, the year after his wife died, Cacker he began up going up to meet on Sunday, and all the tithing men and select men could do, they couldn't get him out to meet him. And when a man neglects means grace and sanctuary privileges, there ain't no saying what he'll do next. Why, boys, just think of it. An immoral critter lying around loose all day Sunday and not putting on so much as a clean shirt when all spectacle folks has on the best clothes and to meet and worshiping the Lord what can you suspect to come of it when he lies idle round his old weekday clothes fishing of some such when the devil should be after him at last, he was our old cack. Here Sam went impressively to my grandfather in the opposite corner to call his attention to the moral, which he was interweaving with his narrative. Well, you see, Captain Abbey told me that when he come to them bars and looked up and saw the dark a-coming down and the storm a-thickening up, he felt that things was getting pretty considerably serious, serious. But there was a dark piece of woods and I kept ahead of him inside the bars. He knew, well, to get in there, the light would give out clean. So he just thought he'd take the hoss out of the team and go ahead a little and see there he was. So he drove his oxen up against the fence and took out the hoss and got on him and pushed along through the woods, not rightly knowing where he was going. Well, for long, he see a light through the trees, and sure enough, he came out to Cax Sparrow's old mill. It was pretty considerably gloomy sort of place that our old mill was. There was a great fall of water coming rushing down the rocks and fell in a deep pool, and it sounded sort of wild and lonesome. But Captain Ebb, he knocked on the door with his whip handle and got in. There to be sure, sought old Cack beside a great blazing fire and his rum jug at his elbow. It was dreadful fellow to drink, Cack was. For all that, there was 
some good in him. He was a pleasant spoken and obliging, and he made the captain welcome. You see, Cap, said Captain Ebb, I'm off my road and got snowed up. Down by your bars, said he. Want to know, said Cap, calculate. You'll just have to camp down here till morning, says he. Well, so old Cap, he got out his tin lantern and went with Captain Ebb back to the bars to help him fetch along his critters. He told him he could put them under the mill shed. So they got the critters up to the shed and got the cart under. And by the time the storm was awful, but Kaki made a great roaring fire. Because you see, Kak Allers had slab wood and a plenty from his mill. A roaring fire, he just is just so much company. It sort of keeps a fellow's spirits up. A good fire does. So Kaki sought on his old tea kettle and made a swinging lot of. Again, I can't read these stories at all, Sly. I gotta stop reading Harry Peter Stowe. Um, I, I tried to read. I tried to read the story, but I couldn't finish it. Um, because I'm um, I'm not really good at reading slang, but I think it's healthy to try to read things and not finish it because that's a healthy experience. Eventually, I'd like to try to find an author who I'm able to actually understand what they're saying. I think I should change it from Harry Peter Stowe to a different author. Let me know in the comments below, did you like the story even though I didn't finish it. Please subscribe to this channel if you're part of the community. And please like this video, it really helps the channel out a lot. Thank you for watching, have a great day, goodbye.